Today is Wednesday, November 10th, 2021. It is 10 a.m. I am Lacey Brooks representing the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives. I am interviewing Robert Bush for the Proud Savannah History Project. We are conducting this interview in Savannah, Georgia via Zoom. Thank you for joining us today. Let's start by having you tell us your full name and please spell your name. Um, my my full name is Robert Wayne Bush. Um, it's um, R O B E R T. I go by middle initial W, uh, but it's Wayne W A Y N E and Bush B U S H. Um, please tell us your pronouns and how you identify. I, I he him his. And when and where were you born? Um, I was born in um, Warner Robins, Georgia uh, in um, 1964 uh, and grew up in middle Georgia. When did you move to Savannah and why? So I moved to Savannah in 1989 um, and uh, it was uh, almost immediately after law school. Um, and I, um, I came to Savannah because part of it was um, kind of, um, part of the reason was kind of a sign of the times because I had actually um, wanted to work overseas and I had a job with the, um, the Judge Advocates General, General Corps um, and I was going to go to Germany uh, to work there. And, um, but what I realized was that you know, I just could not go back into the closet. By that time, um, I just, you know, wasn't willing to accept that. And it was hard enough to get out. And I wasn't fully out at that time, but, um, but I had uh, come a good way. And so, um, so I turned down that job and I was interviewing off season and I um, got an offer from the Savannah law firm. So I, I came here was just, it was, I drove into the city right after Hurricane Hugo passed through, like the Sunday after, <laughs> with the Saturday or the Friday that Hurricane Hugo passed through, so. So when you first came to Savannah with that first um, job um, after law school in 1989, um, what were your first experiences like in Savannah? And you said you were out, you had, you were out at that point in your life. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes, I was out to a uh, certain family and friends. And um, so Savannah is a difficult city to break into. Uh, and, um, and, you know, and, and I, re I remember just, you know, taking some time, um, you know, finding, you know, finding my footing here, finding, you know, social connections. Um, but I did, um, I did want to get involved in um, LGBT advocacy and, and I had a particular concern about HIV AIDS and, and those issues. And um, so uh, I cannot remember how I sought out um, the, the LGBT community here besides socially. Um, you know, at that time I would go to Faces was a bar uh, that was, uh, was a LGBT bar, a gay bar at the time, I guess what we called it. But, um, and then there was Club One, and so there was, um, you know, finding the community through um, sort of the social avenues. Um, and, um, but, you know, I had some very strong, you know, political feelings and feeling that, you know, um, that we should do uh, more political advocacy and, and political activity. And, and, uh, and FCN was extant at the time, and uh, and it focused mostly on social um, social events, and uh, and so you know, which I think was important, but I felt like we needed to do more. Um, and somehow I heard about Mark Krieger um, and the work that he did, and uh, and you know, Mark really was uh, one of the um, the primary faces of the community at the time. Lawrence Marley had left town, but um, his legacy was here. Um, I remember Patty Latham, um, and there were some others, um, but um, somehow connecting through, I think Mark first, um, I kind of plugged into um, 
others in the LGBT community who wanted to do some political advocacy. And, uh, and so, um, and I remember also um, Jamie Mari and Martha Womack um, and, and just, and others whose names escape me at the moment, um, also um, were interested in, you know, taking uh, the LGBT community forward politically. And so, um, so a, a number of them came up with the idea of starting the community action group, which was uh, formed for the purpose of giving a political voice to our LGBT community and, and, and supporting advocacy uh, on political issues. And, uh, and so, um, so I worked with the community action group with uh, Wilson Huff and I. Um, we, um, um, we sort of served as the, um, the, the press team for, um, for the community action group. And we would uh, write um, responses to media uh, that covered um, LGBT issues. And, uh, and, you know, and, and they would even be congratulatory. For example, the, the local paper um, published this you know, astonishing article at the time about a transgender community living in, in Statesboro and taking care of themselves, which is a wonderful thing for them to do because it was not critical and, and, it, and uh, it was very surprising. Uh, so uh, so Wilson and I you know, drafted a letter and then we sent it to the newspaper and we were, uh, you know, our goal uh, was, and our function was to try to, um, you know, bring a, a community voice and community awareness, community voice to our group and community awareness that we're out there and uh, in that, you know, uh, that we're part of their community. So in relationship to that press, those press responses, can you talk about um, your work and your time as a columnist with oh. um, The Edge, was that correct? With the Savannah Morning, it was a, a yes. paper with the Savannah Morning News. Can you talk about I, that a little bit? Yeah, I was the first uh, out uh, gay local columnist and um, and I just wanted to, you know, you know, I think when people bring, you know, bring to advocacy whatever their skills are, you know, and, um, you know, um, my friend Jamie Mowry and Martha Womack came from their counseling background and they did some you know, really important and impactful work, which I hope they'll be talking about on here um, um, from um, from their uh, position as um, counselors, you know, and as an attorney, I was an advocate and um, and so, uh, you know, taking issues and trying to understand them and, and bring, um, bring um, and, and further a position uh, on um, matters that, you know, were important to our community was important to me. And getting out there and putting something out there without apology saying, you know, you know, we're here, we have these opinions. It wasn't always uh, political. It wasn't always LGBT issues that, that the column dealt with. Um, but a lot of a lot of the columns were about political issues, and at that time in the press, most of the um, LGBT um, um, mentions were, you know, negative, and or they were related to what the um, the conservative party was trying to do to exploit our unpopularity, and there were, and it victimized a lot of people, and so um, so. You know, I, I felt that it was important in a lot of ways for us to 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 step out, have a voice, and to, and to uh, make no apology about it, and not really give them room to criticize or judge us. You know, I mean, the the general sort of the the general community and those in the community who would do that, because there were those who supported us. Um, so um, so I um, called the newspaper when I found out they were doing. Um, uh, kind of a local version of creative loafing and I asked if I could do a column then I wrote a sample column and then they accepted it and so for a year as long as the paper existed I did a weekly column and um, and um, you know and in advocacy you know you have you do a, a lot of thankless work a lot of work that people don't know about um, but sometimes you get to do something which brings you pleasure like you felt like you know you had an impact and and I think I think for a lot of us, holding people accountable who would not be held accountable for the damage that they were doing to the LGBT 
members of their community, um, you know, is a really uh, strong interest. And so one of the things I got to do in my column was to hold people accountable. And, I, and, and, uh, and you know, so one of my favorite accomplishments was getting a response from a local legislator after I had criticized him in a, in a column about an issue. And he wrote me back and, you know, or he wrote the newspaper and it was printed in, in the, I mean, in the, the edge, it told me to kiss his ass, you know, and I thought, this is great. You know, this person heard this and they felt uh, some sort of, uh, um, you know, maybe even regret or at least some sort of defensiveness about their position because this was out there to call, you know, to call them on it. So, um, so, you know, I, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't the New York Times and it wasn't the Washington Post, but it was an opportunity in the press uh, and to be read by, you know, multiple people uh, to have an LGBT face there uh, and without apology to say to these people, you know, you're wrong for this and we're going to keep calling you on it. Can you talk about your, um, your active your legal um, assistance that you have worked on um, with the LGBTQ community and how legal action um, furthered your, um, your health in the community? There, there's, there are two, sort of a two, uh, two prong um, part, a two prong uh, structure to this. And, and part of it was LGBT advocacy and the other was um, another thing that was very important to me was um, the injustices um, surrounding um, HIV and the per persecution of persons who were HIV positive or living with AIDS at the time. And um, so I wanted to be able to you know, represent persons uh, with HIV AIDS uh, on, on legal issues. And so, um, so I... I, I had been in Savannah for a couple of years and I left the firm that I was with and um, I was, I wanted to set up a, a project to at least do documents for persons living with HIV AIDS. At that time, I, I was at a juncture, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, um, except that I did know I wanted to do this and it, even if I was leaving Savannah, I wanted to get it set up. And so, um, so Brandy Haywood at Union Mission, um, you know, along with Mike Elliott and then later Mike Freeman, but um, Brandy um, Haywood heard about what I wanted to do, uh, and uh, and so she met with me because they they ha had a program of housing of, uh, for persons with HIV AIDS, and they still have a transitional living facility here, and so they were interested in my, you know, assisting their um, their residents of that facility, and so we ended up. Um, working together, writing a grant, and a year later, um, um, we were awarded the grant. And in the meantime, Georgia Legal Services Program, which is the law firm, uh, the nonprofit law firm that I've uh, worked with ever since and, and currently work with, um, heard about it. They wanted to offer me the, off the offices from which you know I could do the work. Uh, and so uh, I ended up being hired there at some point when a staff attorney position came on. And then it was a year after that that we got the funding for the HIV AIDS project. And then the HIV AIDS project um, was um, it lasted for 13 years. And I represented persons who are HIV AIDS, uh, who had HIV uh, or um, AIDS and uh, on a wide gamut of legal issues. And there was a, a, a similar project in Atlanta that mine was the only other one outside of Atlanta in the state of Georgia. And so, <clears throat> so I try to maximize, you know, cover the area as much as I can. And the philosophy was, you know, come here, you know, I'll, I'll represent you, I'll advise you, I'll refer you, I will at least point you in the right direction, but you, I, you won't leave here without knowing something. And, um, but, um, you know, but it was rough. It was, uh, you know, I had, um, you know, sort of several hundred persons um, um, in the project, and we did everything from uh, advanced directives to uh, federal litigation to an immigration case I had uh, where I represented a, um, a woman who um, whose family uh, um, 
was uh, affected deeply by AIDS and uh, the husband passed and then she had an uh, HIV positive daughter, but an HIV negative son uh, and she was HIV positive. And there were, you know, as um, happens with anyone in, in our society that suffers from any sort of um, um, you know, critical health care situation uh, or any other marginalized um, um, status. Um, there were a lot of implications and a lot of um, legal issues that um, you know, persons who you know, don't suffer these, um, um, in, in these indignities and uh, don't face. And so, um, so um, I represented um, individuals. I um, also taught at um, you know, a lot of conferences because one of the things that was important to me was again, to maximize the, uh, the ability for persons with HIV AIDS to you know, either be represented or to represent themselves on things that they could do if I gave them certain information. And I started this project called Arming the Advocate and I came up with a little booklet and I put information in there about various, um, in, in from in various um, areas, whether it was social security or VA benefits or housing, and even a portion about advocating for themselves uh, in the community um, so, that, um, so that, you know, I'm only one attorney and I can only take so much, uh, so, uh, so many cases. And so I wanted to make sure that we armed people with the best knowledge that we could for them to advocate for themselves. And so uh, I remember presenting this at a clinic at the University of Georgia at the time to a law school class there but also presenting it to various um, statewide conferences and then uh, to three or four um, national conferences um, under the National Association of Persons with AIDS, um, um, which was a very important organization at the time. And, uh, and then I, I did one international conference. I did a poster presentation in Durban, South Africa in, in 2000. Um, so what I tried to do was you know, marry the individual uh, representation with uh, systemic advocacy um, and then efforts to try to enable people to represent themselves pro se on the things that they could uh, represent uh, themselves pro se, which means without an attorney. You know, but it was a hopped up time. It was an intense time. Um, and, you know, um, you know, the you know, the animus and the and the uh, against persons with AIDS was still you know pretty high. Uh, There's still a great stigma. You know, you didn't have um, bill collectors calling you know my clients saying, "Oh, well, you're gonna die anyway, so don't you want to pay your bill?" Or humiliating them if they came in to pay their bill and saying things like that to them and basically disclosing their status. Um, I remember going to the emergency room more than once to argue a client into the emergency room because. Uh, doctors would say, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. They're going to die anyway, but they were in an exigent critical um, healthcare situation and they needed to be treated. And uh, in the hospitals, uh, certain, uh, certain personnel at certain hospitals um, were resistant. And so more than once, I remember going and, and um, advocating uh, just under the, the uh, Emergency uh, Treatment Active Labor Act uh, that you know you have to admit this person or you you face liability, and so so it was a real uh, I mean it was it was an intense a uh, sort of a varied um, kind of advocacy and representation because it, it it just hit on all fronts and you just you know it always felt like you were fighting it always felt like we were fighting and <clears throat> this is something that excuse me that you know is also. I think our, um, you know, our LGBT community has forgotten a lot of this, but at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, if any of us knew any number of people who were actively dying uh, in their partners, and there might be one worse, off, worse than the other that was taking care of the other, there would be in the evening, you might go to the hospital to visit this person because this person was rushed to the hospital on this night, and, uh, and, you know, you had friends and for me, clients dying, you know, and, and it's hard, it, it's, it's hard to, 
convey the sort of siege feeling and maybe mentality at the time. Um, and, and there was incredible pain. Um, there was incredible injustice. And then there was, you know, great love and support from the people who were supportive, you know, and 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 people talk about the lesbian community, how supportive they were, but they, you know, my experience is they were. And um, um, they, you know, they they were there, they carried a, a lot of the water and, and all of us who are in here trying to do the right thing and trying to be supportive when the community we faced <clears throat> would actually choose to do the opposite and persecute along the lines of the person's suffering. And uh, we had, uh, I spoke at World AIDS Day, uh, the, I was the speaker uh, for two years, so between those years, but, but it was held, you know, it was held you know, every year for many years. Uh, and um, we had an AIDS walk that, uh, that we took uh, every year and Club One um, and Kale at Club One, you know, uh, and his partner always, you know, made the the um, bar available and gave support. They they support a, a lot of a lot of activities in the LGBT community. Um, I also, um, you know, there is no uh, underestimating uh, the contribution that Susan Alt, who was the nurse over the Wyatt, local Ryan White clinic, what she did for the the lives of persons with HIV AIDS in, in our community. And, and I, I couldn't even begin to give you a halfway complete list of the ways that she did this, but she was also accountable for the reporting and the grant work and all of this, uh, of the grant uh, uh, that uh, that uh, occurred uh, or that had to happen to support the clinic. And, uh, and so, you know, her name should be mentioned as well. Um, but it's, it's hard, it's hard to talk about that time and really give and, you know, really give uh, a, a, uh, a feel for for what it was like and how badly we'd like to impress upon you know younger LGBT community. You know, this is part of your legacy. Part of your legacy is not that people you know is is this generation because they're dead. You know and you know and LGBT advocacy at the time was just darkened by you know suddenly you know we're dealing with you know, these life and death issues with, you know, the inadequacy of the testing procedures and with, you know, social injustice and, and, <clears throat> and, you know, I remember my first buddy, um, you know, I arrived home from being out of town. I got a call that he was in hospice and he was dying and, and rushing out there and, um, <clears throat> and rushing out to, to the uh, hospice and, Realizing, okay, I'm probably gonna stay overnight, and so um, the um, I got my stuff and, and sat by him in his room, holding his hand. And then the nurse came in and, and I asked her about his family. So they gave me the information to call the family, and so I called them and I told them, look, this is the situation. And then the family responds, you know, oh well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll you know we'll plan to come to Savannah next week, you know, and. Um, and he passed just a, just you know an hour or so later. Me holding his hand and me only having known him so long, um, but uh, but you know I was the person who was there, and that's the way this, these things work. There were buddy systems, and and buddy systems were necessitated because of the lack of other support in a person's life, and uh, and a lot of times lack of support was because of this um, prejudice and ignorance of the person's own families. Um, can you also talk about um, during that time how you were trying to get the word out to the community about what you and other people in the community were trying to do without what I think it would be good to explain how things were different then versus social media is what I'm trying to get. Uh, you know. Yes, yes, you know, it, I, and this is something that you know, it just dawned on me not all that long ago that, you know, we didn't have social media then. So when we, when we stepped out and we did something, it was on conviction, but not necessarily feeling supported or knowing if we were supported, you know, and the advocacy community, because there's a lot of dysfunction um, from in, in our backgrounds and because there's a lot of strong feelings about the way that things should be and because it's really complicated, 
you know, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of infighting, and so uh, so you know you might you know you might take up you know what you think you need to do and you do your best and uh, and this happened on you know on several fronts I think to several people and that is you know you don't you don't have a base bill you can't report back hey I did this and get people you know get you know people affirmation or or you know uh, just you know feeling any support and so you know we were doing this work and you know we didn't have that base to plug back into. We didn't even know what each other was doing in some circumstances because you know, even um, you know Mark Krieger, who, who I you know have a lot of respect for, and when he used to ask me to do anything, I would just whatever it was. I, he asked me to advise FCN about nonprofit status, and I learned it, and I show up at the meeting because he asked because he because I knew that knew uh, of his work, but I didn't know all the things that he had done. Uh, and you know after listening to his uh, you know oral history. Um, that I was like, you know, I knew he was doing some of this. I knew some of these experiences because he would call me about some of them at the time. Um, but, um, but, you know, a lot of what went on, we didn't know the other was doing because we're doing it. And that's the way advocacy happens. People work from where they are. Uh, and, and a lot of advocacy doesn't happen in, you know, in the press. And, um, and like with, you know, the HIV uh, project, you know, um, advocacy, you know, you know, there was the the arm of I would write editorials and you know I would be on TV or something like that. But a lot more work was done what people didn't see and people wouldn't be known wouldn't know about whether it's for individual clients or, for example, you know, my mothers uh, who were my clients would not make arrangements for their children because to do a temporary guardianship, they have to sign over their rights to the child. And they just, they just couldn't do that, no matter how, you know, how poorly they were doing at the time. And so I researched standby guardianship, which is something that happened in uh, other states had where there could be a conditional naming of a guardian. And then I talked to our Atlanta office for the Georgia Legal Services. And then with um, Sylvia Cayley at Atlanta Legal Aid, you know, we wrote a bill uh, for uh, creating standby guardianships that was introduced into um, uh, to the legislature uh, and the Judiciary Committee. It died in that committee that year. But two years later, when um, the legislature was, uh, someone had uh, submitted um, similar legislation, they asked me to come up to testify about standby guardianships and the need for standby guardianships. And so uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the things we do, you know, um, um, in advocacy, you know, there it, it's not out there and it's not um, publicized, and you know, and it's just that you know people care about what they do, and there and there are a lot of people doing this. Uh, so I did do my part and I did make my contribution, but there are all these other people doing this, and then there was there's this continuing line of people coming in now and doing things that I can't do and bring us forward, and you know that's kind of the way that <clears throat> what I've learned that advocacy happens. In being an advocate, sometimes it's hard to let go of a sense of ownership about the way that things should go. Uh, and it took me some time to do that, but now I can just sit back and marvel at, you know, what you know, these new kids are doing and, and you know, see them doing the work that, uh, that furthers us. But I, I wish they could know and not forget what we went through because it was, it was searing and it was, uh, uh, it, you know, it was, it's hard to imagine unless you really want to know about it and seek to learn about it. When were, uh, when was the standby guardianship bill um, introduced or when was it approved? Um, when, do you know that date? I think it was 96 or 98 around there. Okay. And other areas that you were active in um, organizing people to, were there um, forums to help get this information out to the community to help them, the things that you had been working on the back, you know, behind the scenes, now you were trying to get it to people. Yeah, what, I, I was still doing a, yeah, I was yeah. still doing a fair amount of LGBT advocacy at the time. And, um, and so, um, and again, it really was kind of a, a, a white hot time, but, um, but 
you know, even throughout, like on Mayor Floyd Adams, I was the gay, uh, you know, the, the out gay member, the representation of the LGBT, you know, me, the obvious, in those days, it would almost always be a white male, and that's what it was, Mayor, you know, and I was the, um, the LGBT representative of the uh, City Commission on Human Rights, um, and, um, and then I even uh, worked with um, my friend Mike Freeman to do an eight, I think it's a six or eight week class for the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church to become a, a welcoming congregation. Um, and um, um, gosh, there's, there's, I was a member of the board at FCN. Um, they're just, uh, I mean, I was, so I was still pretty involved in LGBT advocacy. And I, I in fact, I won the Stonewall Bar Association Award uh, in 2004 for LGBT advocacy. And that's the uh, sort of LGBT arm of the state bar. Uh, and so, um, so I kept, uh, you know, I kept that going. One of the things that I never, I mean, and I still feel very strongly is that we need to be involved politically. And at the time we were, really a focus of uh, the conservative party uh, that really needed to play against something in order to be um, in order to, in order to elect their candidates you know and sometimes it was immigrants but for many years it was um, you know the LGBT community and so um, so you know it was you know very important for us to to me I've always thought it was very important for us to maintain, a voice and um, and so I always had um, connections to Atlanta and, and be talking with um, you know Jeff Graham or um, Carla Drenner um, you know about you know um, pending legislation and then I would try to um, a, as social media became more of a, a, a concrete thing then you know I would um, use Facebook to um, send um, notices out to uh, uh, a, a collection of names that I collected over several uh, forms that I had done about, hey, this is being considered now, we need to call this person. And, uh, you know, or just, um, you know, make sure you sign this and send it in, something like that to try to make sure that we, we have a political voice. Um, <clears throat> and um, and so, so I did, um, I did start uh, having these forums, which to me, um, it was very important to, uh, number one, to, um, uh, to educate our community about the, um, you know, the, the p political issues of the day uh, and how we can address them. And then later as a political act, it also became very important to me to make sure that we secure LGBT relationships as best we can. At that time, we couldn't marry. But something called the Advanced Directive for Healthcare, it was the only way that we could give an intimate right uh, to a partner. Uh, and so through that document, we could at least give that partner um, the say over what happens to us most personally. Uh, and, uh, you know, regarding our healthcare, even disposition of our remains, all of this, that document would cover. And, and then also, uh, I'll, I'll offer a, a financial power of attorney. Um, <clears throat> but I started having these, excuse me. Um, playing and having these forums where um, we would actually do those documents. And so we had several of them. Uh, I remember the first one was at, <clears throat> at a Middle Eastern restaurant that is no longer on, it was a hook of lounge to uh, on um, Broughton. And uh, I partnered with Gay Savannah to do it. And uh, so it was, you know, we said they were having their social and we had set up a room and back and then we had you know, people come back and I would talk to them about their documents and then we'd actually be able to do the documents on site. And so that just, that was the first. Then we did another restaurant. We did um, uh, the Rainbow Inn um, and Coffee Deli. Coffee Deli um, was, you know, Paula with Coffee Deli was always, you know, willing to support uh, this kind of thing. And, and she knew me and so she said, look, here's the key do it, just lock up when you leave, you know, and you know, it was that kind of unquestioning support, which was pretty wonderful. And, and we did, uh, we did some hundreds of these documents. I don't, I don't know how many, but, um, but um, I, 
I also, because I was doing some elder focused work uh, at uh, my law firm by that time, um, I also started these um, um, cementing LGBT relationships 55 plus. And so I could actually hold these maybe during the day or something because this was consistent with what I would do through work. And so, um, and I started it with LGB, LGBT 60 plus because that's really what this, my, my funded project would cover, but not that many people showed up. But once I changed to the LGBT 55 plus, that made this seemed to make a big difference. So we got, we got a, a lot of attendees. And so, um, so we did, uh, so I did a lot of those. And to me, I called it cementing um, <clears throat> LGBT relationships because I saw each one of these documents as a, you know, an, another brick in the wall of, you know, our community where our relationships matter. And this gives some sort of legal compulsion to our relationships because we couldn't get it through marriage. And so, <clears throat> so I did those. And then I also did some, um, I, I'm gonna try to share the screen for a moment. And, um, I also did some um, political um, or some um, informational sessions um, that um, on um, political issues or important issues to the community. I had to kind of be careful about whether, whether they were political, or whether they were informational. But as an attorney, I thought well, what I can do is share legal knowledge about well, what are your rights? You know, obviously they're not where they should be, but what are they? And so this, if you can see this one, can you see this? Uh, this is um, one that we did, I think this one was 2014, uh, and it was our first um, um, forum for the transgender community. And we had a transgender uh, attorney working for us at the time. And so we prepared a forum and, um, and I always try to partner with a, 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 an organization because I just thought that was a good idea. Uh, and at this point, um, FCN wasn't really interested in doing this, but Savannah Pride jumped on it. And, uh, and Mark Hill, who um, I think, you know, um, uh, you know, really was uh, really brought kind of a, a congenial and thoughtful and dedicated and uh, committed center to our community at a time when we needed it. Um, and one of the reasons I feel that way is the way that he would respond to doing something like this, like, sure, I'll do it. We'll provide refreshments was his response. And so we pulled this together and we did this uh, back in 2014. Um, and so, um, so I started doing um, legal forums, and, um, and I remember we had another one at Coffee Deli about um, a report, you know, reporting back on the um, um, a report that um, um, provided information uh, and data about aging LGBT uh, persons and the, the the sort of the profile of their lives and you know where. Um, where things could be better and how they could be better. Um, that one wasn't as well as attended as some, but um, but we did that. And uh, then um, we did um, this one here. This was a um, um, a legal forum that it was after DOMA, the the uh, the Supreme Court uh, in Windsor, uh, U.S. v. Windsor, um, overturned uh, the. Um, Defense of Marriage Act, which um, um, was was a big deal for our community. It wasn't marriage; it didn't give us marriage, but it did uh, um, um, remove some of the laws restricting in you know, our relationships. And so, <clears throat> so excuse me. So I planned with um, Amy Cross and was um, my intern at the time, and she was going to Savannah Law School here. And so she and I, um, and she as a representative of the out, Outlaws and Allies at Savannah Law School, uh, planned this forum. And then um, my buddy from um, law school, one of my best friends, uh, happens to be a, a, a law professor. And he was dean of student affairs at some point or, and for some time. And, uh, but uh, he um, um, specialized in like, immigration law, but also sexuality and the law. So um, he and I prepared um, a presentation, and we presented it to the law the law school. And uh, so um, we had um, law uh, these uh, law students attend, in addition to uh, private attorneys. And uh, and then um, we got the word out, and the private attorneys were able to get continuing legal education credits for attending. And so this was a, a way to try to use you know our particular. Um, perch to um, 
you know, to try to get out the message. And also these were the, these students were kind of charged. And so it's sort of like you feel like you're charging people to go out in the community and kind of further the, the message. And so so that went uh, really well. And then the next day, um, our um, our good friend um, um, Laurie Sir, Laurie Sermay, who is a, a lesbian attorney in Atlanta, highly respected, especially with her adoption work. But uh, she came down and she joined us for um, a forum um, that um, I had gotten Candler Hospital to to give us uh, a room for. And so we held the forum. Twenty seven people attended that, and <clears throat> it was the same after Dolma, but it had less of the legal technical bent to it. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, and then at, after each of my forums, I did, you know, I do, um, um, a review, uh, 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 the forms that they can review it and, and, uh, they can, uh, it was kind of like a satisfaction form. How was it? And get some comments from them. And, and so it was very well, very well received. And <clears throat> so that was, uh, that was one of the, the, um, the, um, first bigger forums. And then. Um, we also also did um, one that was probably the biggest, and I think we had we had about like 38 people attend this. But this was a self defense for the LGBT community in Georgia, uh, and this was um, again it was an effort to talk about you know what are legal issues affecting LGBTs in Georgia, what are legal rights in Georgia, and so um, so I um, I asked um, Candace Hardnett who um, you know has her own um, you know, outstanding advocacy, um, you know, in the community, um, as well as uh, I can't. I'm trying to get this little thing to go down. I'm not sure how to do it, but um, but Pam Miller, uh, I asked Pam Miller, who um, has you know been very active in the LGBT community and actually you know ran as an out lesbian candidate for I think it was the city council, um, and it might have been the Board of Education, but she, but the first out lesbian to run for an office here in Savannah, and Mark Hill, <clears throat> because I thought these were great faces of our community that each have done great work, and so we got together and we talked about this and we planned this event and we asked uh, Carla Drenner, who was the first openly gay uh, individual elected to statewide office in Georgia, in addition to Simone Bell, who was the first openly gay African-American state lawmaker in the U.S. to be elected to state office. And then uh, Jeff Graham, who um, is probably the you know, most esteemed LGBT advocate uh, in, in Georgia uh, because of his many, many committed years, and, uh, and he's the executive director of Georgia Equality. So they came down, and we uh, held another um, uh, Form uh, about legal rights and um, about uh, legislation that um, Representative Drenner um, um, had proposed and had had been proposing for some years to protect LGBTs from uh, discrimination in um, 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 employment in Georgia. So, um, so that was probably the biggest form that we did. Um, and then, um, and then, so I, you know, I've kept up that kind of thing for a while. And then the last one that I did was one uh, that happened right before COVID. It was uh, February 6th, 15th, uh, 2020. And, you know, um, I had taken some um, a name change cases for our transgender community because I felt it was important to feel out, like, in, especially in some of the counties around Savannah, how are they treated? And, uh, but there are only so many that I could take. And then also there was a need to have uh, gender marker changes done as well. And so, <clears throat> So um, I uh, worked with um, to, to prepare uh, documents where um, you know, persons could represent themselves pro se, uh, again, without an attorney. So they wouldn't have to pay an attorney because the name change is something that they can do uh, if they're you know, uh, uh, educated about how to do it, um, they can do it pretty easily. And so you know, I try to prepare the pleadings that they can use and they can complete the, the pleadings. And I had this, um, book with the the directions about how to complete this and then like in court this is what basically the judge is going to ask you just be prepared for this that's you know it's really pretty a simple process uh, and then um you know we just try to I try to pr um, prepare everything that they might need so all they need to do is complete it and file it and then go through the process get the final order uh, and then petition uh, if they need, uh, want to change their gender mark their uh, 
marker on their birth certificate. And so um, and these are the, the attachments that they needed to, uh, to uh, put on there. And so, um, <clears throat> so, so in my work really came, has come from, you know, what my position is or what my background is and, uh, and I guess what my skills are. And so, you know, I'm trying to maximize what I can in my advocacy through using, you know, my uh, um, Saturn. And, uh, and so, you know, that's kind of been my focus. Do you recall any pivotal points in time or major event that was a turning point in Savannah as it relates to the LGBTQ community, either, either a positive turning point or a negative? Um, experience or event, excuse me. Do you recall anything like that from during the time? I don't know if I, I think of a, like a major pivotal event. Um, one thing I do think is a, a wonderful sign of the times is that you know, the mayor has, you know, you know, named a task force, an LGBT task force, and it's a diverse task force. And, uh, and you know, I think there might be differing opinions in the community about, you know, how effective it is. Um, but I don't have any criticisms of it. At, at least uh, one of the things is that I just know what <laughs> what a huge thing this is that the mayor has done this. You know, back in the day, you know, we would have our um, politician friends, but it would be kind of, you know, we're keeping their distance, but they would try to work on our issues or you know, and and. And we started there uh, and we move forward you know, progressively here. But um, I think that, that that is something to me that really speaks uh, about how far we've come. Um, but, but it was, progress, progress was you know, episodic and inching forward and at times painful. And there was never that big thing that you know, we could celebrate, I think, um, except, you know, I guess we had the Supreme Court decisions and that wasn't really local. The mood, in, the mood, uh, I think that the Garden of Good and Evil and Lady Chablis, you know, I just, I, you know, I don't want to say in spite of itself, but uh, I just think that that had a huge effect to like opening, uh, opening up how people, uh, see, um, you know, at least maybe, you know, the transgender community and, uh, you know, and there are some flaws with it, but uh, I do think that was kind of a big deal as far as kind of giving, um, giving a lot of people um, space to be able to not disapprove of what they're seeing. So in that kind of idea, you've been here thir more than 30 years in Savannah. Do you see, do you feel like there has been a change in that inclusive feel for Savannah? Have we, I know it's been slow, but do you feel like it has changed from when you first got here to where we are today? Or is there still too much, I mean, still a lot more to be done? I think, I mean, there's there's still a lot more to be done. I think we, I, I think there, again, I um, back in 2015, Emergent Savannah asked me to uh, arrange a panel for uh, the um, uh, under the thesis of um, gay uh, LGBT history in Savannah, and so I asked Jamie Mari uh, and Patty Latham and um, Sean Brandon uh, to speak. And one of the things that we did, we we listed every single name that we could think of of people who contributed, you know, and then we and then we just try to talk about the the history here in Savannah, and <clears throat> and it's clear that things are getting better. Um, but there were also persons present who wanted to talk about the issues that they were feeling very strongly, uh, and uh, and a part of it had to do with transgender inclusion and things that we really do need to address. And I think the um, you know I think the tenor of advocacy uh, is always one where there is an expectation that there is another step to be taken. There are more steps to be taken and there are more voices to be heard and that there has to be more effort to make these diverse voices um, um, brought uh, to the, the stage and given their, their uh, hearing and that we have to adjust how we see things. And so those of us who are you know, old advocates, 
you know, we we can't, you know, we can't not challenge the way that we see things, or we can't challenge or not challenge uh, what we feel is the right thing to do because you know there's so much more to learn. We all come from our limited backgrounds, and it's a constant process of uh, being open to educating and learning uh, and realizing that what I have to say in some ways is important and what I stuff I did in some ways was important uh, and uh, but you know there are a lot of other people doing things that were important that I could not have done and that I have to step aside and I have to um, allow them to have their say and I also have to question what my perceptions are and um, and so um, so I think it's very much a living thing I think we have you know conflict in our community will there will always be that and i think in any advocacy community and that's because people are trying to make something happen that they believe should happen but people have different ideas about how it should happen or what should be the end result or how we should do it and you know it's just it's not an exact process uh so i think that a lot has been achieved i think there's a lot left to achieve i think the lgbt center is a wonderful thing i think the um the um the group of, of um, advocates that got behind that and made it happen uh, and are working are struggling to to um, to make sure that it survives uh, you know I'm really proud of them and you know and I realize they they are good at that that's uh, there's not really a place in that for me and that's okay because they can do that a whole lot better than I can except I can support it you know so so we've come a long way. There's always something to do. And sometimes those of us who've had certain roles realize our roles change and that's okay. You know, we just, you know, to me, I still want to re remain uh, aware and open to what contributions I can make. I will say this, I, I did want to mention this because there are so many things in, in advocacy where, um, <clears throat> where you don't get real satisfaction of uh of like ah oh, we you know hit a home run or whatever or we did something that really held somebody accountable and there was this one day uh that i was uh, i was in the office and uh, i learned that mike bowers who was running for governor at the time was going to be making an airport uh campaign stop in savannah and so um so at that time, Mike Bowers had just withdrawn a job offer to Robin Shahar, who was a lesbian, who was a very accomplished uh, um, um, law uh, or new attorney um, and, uh, and had been offered a job by the state, but then he withdrew the job because <clears throat> there was a sodomy statute in Georgia and that uh, the fact that she was lesbian meant that you know it that she uh, uh, wasn't you know uh, wasn't deserving of getting getting a state job but there's a conflict of her having a state job uh, and so um, so he took the job away from her and and at the time the, the, the sodomy statute was a real you know real problem and, and one of our issues anyway and so so I heard that he was going to be here so I ended up taking vacation time driving out to the airport and standing there, because I look like I could be conservative, you know, just standing there with all the people there who were just ready to, you know, su to support him. And uh, and so he steps down and he's just this, you know, uh, he's got this, there's a real arrogance, but the, a story had come out in previous weeks that he had been having an adulterous affair. And so he had been breaking Georgia law. So he was saying that Robert Jarrett was breaking Georgia law, he didn't deserve a job. He had been breaking Georgia law this whole time, but now he's trying to, you know, save his campaign. So he's going around and just, I'm as hard as, you know, rolled steel, you know, and just really just coming off. And I got to raise my hand and I, and I was like, you know, you know, um, Mr. Bowers, you know, considering the fact that you withdrew this job from Robert Shahar for your imputed, you know, breaking uh, her behavior as breaking the laws of Georgia, do you really think that you should be running for governor when you were doing the same thing? You were having this adulterous affair. And, <clears throat> and I was in like a, a very not uh, sympathetic crowd, you know, and, and I could just, but I could just see it kind of hitting, you know, and so then he kind of kept trying to, you know, keep his, you know, keep his, uh, on his message. 
And then I just asked again, I said, yes, but you were violating the law. As far as we know, you're still violating the law. Having sex with a woman is not your wife, although you are married, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so, you know, it wasn't like a huge thing in effect, but it was one of those few circumstances where I got to help hold someone accountable in a very simple, direct way. It's like, you have to face these words. And that's what we are subject to all the time and still are to a great extent these days. People saying these hypocritical things about us as if we're morally inferior and as if we don't deserve jobs, you know, um, or other opportunities because of who we are. So that was, uh, so if, when I think about, you know, a, a moment that I really enjoyed or an advocacy that stands out for me personally, uh, that, that, is, that is one of the better moments. So can you <clears throat> tell us what the proud Savannah History Project means to you, having heard about this? What, what kind of feelings do you have about this project? You know, I think it's important for history to know the lives of gays and lesbians. I think it's important for them to know the struggles um, that our community has gone through. I think it's important for our community to know what has come before. And you know, I, what I have learned is there is such a short memory for very significant things. And that I think this is an opportunity to, um, to secure those memories and that knowledge that I don't think, I mean, I think we would lose otherwise. And, uh, and then it's also an opportunity to, to really learn about, you know, what others have done, because I've watched some of these and I'm like, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, and, um, and, and that's, you know, especially when there would not be recordation at the time, there wasn't, but you can't go to Facebook and pull these things forward and say, this is, oh, this was, this happened and, uh, and on this date, or here's a photo or, you know, uh, you can't do that. And so, so I think it's important to know that. Um, I think if you don't know your history, um, then you know I think you don't you know you're not very good at taking the next step in an effective way. And uh, and so uh, so I guess for those reasons I feel like I, I think it's I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's would have been totally un, unheard of, you know, 20 years ago that this happening. And this kind of value be given to the voices of LGBT persons, um, you know, that's pretty awesome. So, uh, so I, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful project, and I really appreciate the fact that the city of Savannah is doing it. So, are there any other thoughts that we haven't covered? Um, was there anything about your um, advocacy or your own life that you wanted to include in this particular uh, oral history that we haven't spoken of yet? Um, yeah, you know, I think you covered it pretty well. You know, I'm, you know, <clears throat> I'm a happy gay man and have been for a long time. And, you know, that's possible in this world. And, uh, but I'm not going to shut up if I feel like I need to say something. And I'm glad that my brothers and sisters in the LGBT community are the same way, because, you know, we're not really going to give you room to judge us. And we're going to participate in this in our communities and saving our communities and working on our principles, um, <clears throat> you know, by, you know, whatever we need to do to make sure that, uh, you know, we're respected and that uh, we are able to partic participate in our communities as uh, the same as anyone else. But we don't just do it for ourselves. Um, we would be nowhere without allies. And so we are here to be allies uh, because the principles go far beyond the marginalized groups that they affect. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing your history with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lacey.